I love the tube here in London, and I love the fact that you can showcase art. And the tube sort of connects everybody and makes everything go around. It's the first time I've noticed it. Has it been there for long? Well, I'm uh, perhaps at a loss. I don't think people would realise it was art. They'd probably think it was a symbol for something to do with the underground, mm. or, you know, that it wasn't meant for them, you know, like it was a code or something. These uh, artworks have been popping up all over the place. I didn't know what they were, a bit strange. We saw customers start putting their fingers around it. But then we started playing with it ourselves and we thought, oh, this is quite fun. And we tried to get people involved saying, have you noticed that? They themselves, when they find you on the platform, they say, oh, yeah, thank you very much. I found one at Clapham North, but it's not on the platform. I said, yeah, it's hidden. It's like a treasure chest. So 2013 was the 150th anniversary of London Underground. And Art in the Underground were looking for a way of really marking that moment and thinking about how we could make a work which would really have impact across the network. Um, at that time we were thinking about who the right kind of artist might be. There was really only one person that we could think of that really fitted the bill. Um, that was Mark Wallinger. He's very well known um, for the fact that he won the Turner Prize and a number of his works um, were made independently of um, Transport for London actually on the underground. And the light shineth in the darkness And the darkness shone to him with this moss Then the big challenge was what, what was that thing going to be? What was that artwork that would translate across different places and different areas of London and be meaningful to millions and millions of people? The idea of making something for the underground to celebrate 150 years, I found rather exciting and close to my heart, really. So I've got a thing about transport and being transported in a, in a more imaginative or even spiritual sense. I was brought up in Chigwell, Essex, so that's my tube stop. And I suppose part of growing up was doing that kind of shunt between the city and the sort of countryside. In fact, the, the rail line ran about 100 yards behind my mum and dad's place, so part of my childhood was going down to the footbridge and um, waving at the drivers, hoping that, to get a toot or a wave back, you know. The sound of the underground going overground behind my house was, was a rather soothing kind of thing. So, so it's been in my psyche, I suppose, for all those years, yeah. Mark Wallinger's work is incredibly important. It's the first time we've ever actually attempted to put a piece of artwork on every single station on the network. And it's a way of not only celebrating our past, but leaving a legacy for the future. Our hope is, of course, that in hundreds of years' times, Mark Wallinger's signs and artworks will still be there on the system. In the end, I thought it would be quite nice to, to have something that, that was a kind of poetic link with both the underground and I suppose the kind of history of the graphic language. And so that kind of led me to think about mazes and then labyrinths. And the labyrinths may look at first sight like a maze, but actually there's only one route in and one route out. So it, I thought that was a nice symbol of both the individual sense that one makes of those kind of journeys and one's encounters with the tube and also stands for a kind of mental space or something a bit more contemplative. It's, it's different, isn't it? Different. It's a maze. I think it's a labyrinth. 
That's what it looks. That's what it looks like to me. A labyrinth, of course. So a labyrinth is the simplest type of maze. So it's a very long path that starts from some point outside. And unlike a maze where you have to make decisions, in a labyrinth you never make a decision, but you just wind and wind and wind around until you find you've got to your target or end. If you actually look at the artworks, you'll notice there's no interpretation material, there's no caption, there's nothing to say this is by Mark Wallinger. Rather than being forced to, to know about them and like them and be loyal to them, in a sense what we've tried to do is kind of build on that sort of folkloric sense of something within the urban realm, if you like. But if there, um, if there are 270 of these, um, where can one get, get one? Every station will have its own different labyrinths. There are 270 stations and we thought it'd be nice to kind of number each one a bit like a print edition or, or, or something that kind of alluded to the fact that this is an, an artwork. There are an infinite number of possible labyrinths. You can create them using um, mathematical algorithms uh, which have very nice sort of form to them. So you start off with a basic thing called a seed. A seed is a, a simple geometrical design, and then you follow a list of instructions to create the bigger shape out of that, that basic design. I had, had the idea it'd be quite nice if they were numbered according to the optimum journey of, of the record holder for going through every station on the tube network in, in the fastest time. He starts in Chesham and finishes at Terminal 5 and, uh, and they're numbered according to his route. That idea, actually, of embedding in the Labyrinth project, that passion and that challenge of attempting to visit all stations on the system, I think is really key. And I also think it's one of these little quirks to the whole project, which, which I think actually adds to its charm and to its power in terms of its ar ar artistic endeavour. Because, yes, it helps embed the idea that there are some people who find the underground such a challenge, such a passion. I've actually visited all of the... Uh tube stations out there and uh, created my own little book of where you need to be on the train so that you can get exactly the right door so that you cut off the door and straight out the exit. Every single train station that you visit, you have to write down the name of the station, the time that the doors open at the station, the time that the doors close at each station as well. 39 and 37 seconds. Excuse me, thank you. A lot of possible combinations of how you get from A to B. You've got to pick where you want to start, where you want to finish. There's quite a bit of mathematics and problem solving behind it. He, he gets off at Snaresbrook and legs it to Walthamstow Central. That, that, that's an interesting move. Um... The numerical order was, of course, the order that stations were visited on the Tube Challenge. But, of course, the interesting thing about that is, is almost from the day that we made the decision to go with that particular run, that particular challenge, somebody was endeavouring to break it. So it's actually remarkably ephemeral in many respects. The world record for this has been held many times by many different people. I've actually held it three times myself, don't hold it anymore. But I don't believe that any of the other challenges that have held the record so far have had it sort of immortalised in artwork on the underground. It, it actually looks like the underground to me. <laughs> Massive um, lines and which one do I take? <laughs> I think one of the other things that fascinates me about the labyrinths, of course, is the use of those really almost iconic parts of the London underground fabric. You know, the, the dimensions of the artworks themselves are identical to our trackside roundels. The use of vitreous enamel, which, of course, we've used for decades, and they're parts of the clue, I think, of London underground. The labyrinths are manufactured by the, the same people that make the signage for them underground, so it's completely in keeping with that. So it's a vitreous enamel, very like punchy black and white graphics. It 
it's kind of spectacular and kind of humbling at the same time that each individual signs hand printed with such care and craftsmanship. Yeah. The labyrinths are all circular, so that kind of echoes the round or to an extent, and the red cross at the bottom represents us, I guess, or it says you are here, and, um, and that gives you the, the cue to enter into the puzzle, if you like. It was quite an audacious idea, really, that he'd been obviously commissioned to produce an artwork and came back with the idea for 270. Because it's a permanent piece, we obviously, it, we didn't want to steal the thunder of the artworks instantly, but sort of build up this campaign that starts to uh, engage uh, and play with, with customers rather than show the pieces themselves. Essentially X uh, is where the journey starts and we use this as a, a sort of neat metaphor to start the campaign. I think it was the first one that I saw and I was just like, oh, what's this? And then um, like a few of my friends had seen them as well and we just went around seeing if we could just get photos of all of them. People are already starting to set themselves their own challenge of finding the artworks and photographing them. In some cases we had amazing people actually um, telling us the artworks were up before we even had that confirmation. People are wanting tattoos. I think that idea of um, labyrinths locating or being associated with a given station, a given place, there's lots of loyalty to home stations on the underground. There were huge opportunities to push uh, a merchandising strand in di you know, different areas to, to start tapping into this idea that people take ownership of their own station. They've definitely got a life beyond the artworks within the stations. London Underground is a huge sprawling network and um, many of the stations do seem quite difficult to navigate, find your way around. So representing a new artwork as a labyrinth or a maze or something that does represent the idea of being lost was going to be a, quite a difficult challenge for us, I think. To rethink the idea of what it means to travel around London Underground and do that without being concerned about the, the message that that might give. It proved actually quite a challenge in many respects, finding the space on each station for Mark's artworks. And you'd think, really, that given the size of the underground, it would be simplicity itself to find a single small place on every station for these artworks. But in fact, actually, there's a lot more complexity about that. We wanted to be able to put them in places where they actually stood almost alone, yet at the same time weren't isolated. In one or two places, we've actually had to make the decision to almost hide them around corners. So I think we were equally aware of the fact that it would be a, a nice opportunity for people to search out these artworks if they wanted to do so. Yeah, it just looks interesting and, um, and it, it connects with the idea of, you know, just trying to find your way out of the maze, like the underground. And every station you go to is different from the other station. And you have to still try and figure out which way to go, what to do. Oh, no. It's like it's taking you back out somehow. Who did it? You sure it doesn't take any of these um, chemicals? I come from East Croydon up to uh, London Bridge and then to Bermondsey, yeah. yeah. It's a good route, actually. I think it's a bit of a labyrinth. I normally get lost. <laughs> I get lost everywhere. I really do. And that's, that's no kidding. I really do. Yeah. Even I could find my way out of that one. <laughs> Eventually. This is Newbury Park. Please mind the gap between the train and the platform. If you want to um, design a, a labyrinth or a maze or find your way around, the, the mathematics is what we call the mathematics of networks and is using exactly the same ideas as we would use to move people around in the underground. These are permanent artworks. So hopefully they'll be here in another 50-odd years' time. So how do we actually start to imprint the idea of labyrinth into the, the minds of future generations? So something that's 
crucial for art in the underground anyway is engagement with young people. Um, so we've been working with an artist called Harold Offe on a tangential project to Labyrinth, um, which is essentially taking the idea of journeys and travels at its core, but taking it into a, a sort of new dimension. So the idea of being transported into another space, which is something that's very pertinent and important to Mark Wallinger, is also um, an element and, of Harold Offe's project. All right, hi everyone. Uh, so here we are. I mean, it's been a few months maybe since we last met. So we're here at Notting Hill when we kind of sort of first went on our initial journeys and we're thinking about the whole idea of kind of creating the artwork for the underground, the escalators, Notting Hill, Bethnal Green, Ladbrook Grove. I mean, I, I'm really excited about what's been produced. I hope you're going to be. And today, because it's so busy, it's a Saturday, it's really great to imagine all the that hundreds and thousands, maybe millions of people over the months that are going to see the artwork. So have a good look, see if you can spot your contributions, and hopefully you're going to enjoy it. But thank you so much for your hard work. It, this is your stuff that's out there. The design that I did was the St Paul's station, which is the big pink circle just over there. Uh, it's good, it's good to like, because when we were designing them, it was like, oh, they're going to go in a train station, but we didn't realise just how sort of wide scale they were going to be. So it's really good for us and for the other kids to see just how it goes all the way down, how many people there are just seeing the artwork that we designed. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it because it's bold and it's just really good to look at. It makes the station stand out more as well. Well, it's, it's making me feel a bit famous, and and we've enjoyed it dur during the Easter holidays, make like brainstorming stuffs, and it was a good experience. To see their work presented professionally in an environment which um, an artist like Mark Wallinger would also have his work presented in is hugely important. Once again, it's about breaking down those those barriers and demonstrating it. So it's an open and accessible place for lots and lots of different people to respond to. I think for a lot of young people it can be quite localised in terms of, you know, they know their areas really well, but beyond that it can be, you know, almost another world, really. It was interesting how many of them hadn't necessarily used the tube or um, hadn't necessarily even kind of gone to East London, because a lot of them are based here in sort of around Labrick Grove. So even the idea of maybe going on a journey to Bethnal Green is sort of quite a thing for them. So I think one of the things I was sort of really interested in was sort of like mapping that experience um, and really getting a sense of how the underground and using the tube to kind of travel perhaps might give them some ownership really of this place called London. I mean, the drivers drive the trains, but people come in. Either they've come out here and they want to get off, and they think, well, where's Harrods? Well, it's not on Oxford Street, it's down in Knightsbridge. Or they're coming in and they want to go somewhere, like, you know, what's the best stop for the London Zoo? So I tell them. So there's a kind of mindset that, <laughs> that one has to get into to, to deal with the fact that one's being shut off underground with millions of other people. It's, it's very strange. You know, particularly rush hour, where everything seems so kind of chaotic and, and extreme. But in fact, really, what's going on is pretty much everyday people just go from their homes to their place of work and back again. So what looks like an incredibly entangled kind of mess, uh, individually, people are just following their same route um, to and fro. Another labyrinth is a non-traditional one. This is the London Underground Network. And it grows every year and it gets more complex as time goes by. People still struggle to read the tube map. Where you see people like trailing the, um, like their route, it's the same thing that's happening here. The Harry Beck map does become mapped onto one's mind, really. And, I mean, I never carry a tube map because I feel like I know it, you know. It is a sort of internalised network it's, and it's part of one's identity as a, as a Londoner, I think. I mean, if you really think about it, it's kind of a most colossal effort moving millions of people every day um, across this 
around this map, really, because um, that's how, that's, in a way, that's the only way we can picture it. It's a sort of map or a representation of what London is and has been and how it's changed. And in a way, it it it, it represents the journeys that people have made to the centre of this place, London, and, and that's from all around the world. What's interesting is that the everyone associates the labyrinth with Crete and the Minotaur, and that's absolutely um, where it is most famous. But the same idea can be found all around the world. So either the, the idea has been taken around the world by explorers or whatever, or much more likely the same mathematics has been rediscovered in different cultures to produce the same shape. Labyrinths seem to be in common through all civilizations, Native Americans, uh, throughout Asia, Africa. So we gather together as many of these different kind of families, if you like, and then we're kind of spinning off variations from, from those. So there's the Cretan original, if we, if, we, if we want to call that the original, which is a sort of seven ring uh, universal kind of, it's very distinctive and it was on Crete coins, coinage and all the rest of it. It's the one on the floor in Chartres Cathedral and, 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 and that was very influential on, on a lot of other labyrinths. And in, in a way that, that was there for people who hadn't necessarily made an enormous pilgrimage to the cathedral, but they could just trace their way around this labyrinth. The idea was that if you were too poor to go on a pilgrimage, you'd go to the Holy Land, to Rome or to uh, Jerusalem or somewhere like that, you went to the cathedral and you actually walked the maze as a kind of a spiritual journey. The idea of a maze um, being um, a sort of a journey through life or a symbol uh, and people using it um, as part of their worship or as a spiritual quest, you know, finding themselves, I think, uh, is something that interests me. And I think there is something, yeah, of the mythic about about these labyrinths that, yeah, that, that kind of chime with something as modern or as contemporary as the network of, of the tube. People, when they get used to seeing these around the tube, will learn to trust the fact that it, it's a labyrinth rather than a, a maze. And maybe that's rather similar to what that kind of bond of trust that we have with the London Underground. Maybe that's the thing that I like about public transport or, or that says something about civic society. That, and, and I mean, I made a piece a year or so ago called The Unconscious, which was, um, uh, well, basically a series of photographs lifted from the, the net of people asleep on public transport. And we, we, we willingly kind of give ourselves away, in, in a sense, yeah. So that, that kind of trust and that... Um, well, almost belief, really, because n none of us uh, have any idea how it works, really, <laughs> fundamentally, you know. And but but there's a sort of mass willingness and and trust and uh, a kind of, in a sense, almost a release from the very worries that 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 that, that the underground might conjure up. Well, when I first saw this work of art, I thought it looks like a brain. What is a brain doing in this brain box of a station? If it's uh, a brain, maybe you're encouraging us to, or we're, um, uh, like eliciting ideas or something that, I don't know. Oh, gosh. No idea. Molly, what do you think that is? A brain. A brain. <laughs> I don't know, it's a bunch of uh, swiggly lines, it looks like, I don't it's know. A, it's a brain. It's a brain? It, it, it's no coincidence at all that the brain looks like a labyrinth. And the reason is, the brain, it's got lots of neurons, and the neurons are all connected up, and they are forming a network, and again, what's that like? It's just like the tube map, or like the internet as the brain tries to connect everything together. One can deal with bricks, but then after a while we just have to call it wall. <laughs> there's there's the, the one and then there's the very many, and all those spaces in between are where mathematics and art and everything else 
exists really and, and to find patterns or meanings between the, just the individual and the, and the so numerous that it's impossible for us to, to know without inventing tools and structures to, to, to intervene. So I suppose in a sense this is kind of about that process really. Actually to understand these things you, you do eventually have to enact them, yeah. Which is nice, so I've never made a piece that people have to touch to kind of know. It is quite surprising where it sends you. <laughs> you think that one's able to take that in, but, but it's impossible unless you actually enacted it. If I can make a stranger move his finger <laughs> uh, to cover a, every, in a way, every trace of this thing, that would constitute quite a feat, really, yeah. I suppose I am attracted to kind of circularity, and I suppose I, I quite like work that's self-reflexive on, on, on its medium, you know. A day is the smallest kind of unit of time in which one can contemplate how things are the same or different or, you know, from the, the previous day, and so that's the natural way of self-reflection. And, and I suppose having them on the tube it, it is rather suggestive that there's a beginning of a journey and then a, a kind of eventual return, and that is a sort of daily ritual for, for most people.